Hi, everybody, and welcome to today's edition of the Seven Investing Podcast. I'm Luke Hallard, and I'm joined by my co host, Christoph Pikarski. Christoph and I are lead advisors at Seven Investing, where it's our mission to empower you to invest in your future. Today, we are diving deep into the world of finance, specifically the often confusing and frustrating realm of international money transfers. We'll be exploring hidden fees, the challenges of cross-border transactions, and looking for innovative solutions that are empowering consumers to take control of their money. Now, if you have ever vacationed internationally, and if you are still using your legacy bank or credit card, this is a must-listen conversation that we hope will open your eyes and save you money. If you have been following my 50-day social media challenge reviewing my entire investment portfolio, you'll be well aware that one of my favorite companies in the world is Wise, previously known as TransferWise. And for anyone unfamiliar, Wise is a global technology company revolutionizing the way we move money around the world with a mission that's simple yet powerful to make international money transfers instant, convenient, transparent, and incredibly affordable. Basically everything that traditional banks are not. I have been a personal and a business customer of Wise, plus a shareholder for over two years now. And Christoph, I was in Austin a couple of weeks ago paying you a visit, and you also remembered that you were a Wise customer. Indeed, I you you had me open up my account, and I realized that I have seven hundred bucks in there from previous international transfers. So, like, yay, Wise is great. <laughs> And while we were in Austin, the Wise team were kind enough to invite us both into their offices, have a chat, meet the CEO, understand more about the company. And uh, we thought we'd have a great follow-up conversation today to really go down the rabbit hole with a particular aspect of that conversation we're having face-to-face. And so to guide us through the complex landscape of today's call, we've got a very special guest joining us on the podcast, Rena Wolfring from the North American policy team at Wise. Rena, welcome to the Seven Investing Podcast. Thank you so much for having me. Excited to be here. Now, before we dive into the specifics of Wise's approach and the challenges of the money transfer industry, could you give us a little bit of background on yourself and how you became to be involved with Wise's policy team? I'd love to. Thank you. So I'm currently at Wise as a policy lead for North America. That means I work with different governments and regulators on how to make cross-border payments better for everybody, right? And previously to this, kind of on the policy track, uh, worked for two different members of Congress, specifically on financial services policy. Most recently was chief of staff for a member of Congress from Washington State, which is where I'm from. And then previous to the Hill, as they call it, um, I worked in Senegal uh, relatively briefly at a nonprofit there. And um, and what brought you to WISE? What initially drew you to their mission of making international money transfers more affordable and transparent? One thing that struck me about WISE and the people who come to work here, and I wonder if this was your experience as well being in the Austin office, is everyone has a pretty personal story as to why they've connected with this mission to improve cross-border payments. And with that mission-driven focus, Everyone I spoke to, one, was so impressive, right? But then also just seemed so committed to the cause in a way that was, one, very cool and also resulted in a very, very good product that I had been using previously. So I guess previous customer is is maybe the fastest way to answer that. (laughs) And and I guess Wise is famous for having an incredibly high level of word of mouth advertising. Like indeed, I've told a bunch of friends and family about Wise. My wife's got it. My dad's got a a Wise card now. And I talk about it on the Seven Investing podcast quite often too. Oh, that's fantastic. Yeah, 60, I think over 60% now of our customers come from word of mouth. So all thanks to you. Thank you. (laughs) Christoph, you told any friends and family about the Wise? Uh, I have. In fact, I spent part of my time in Sicily. uh, So uh, all of those payments are now much easier for me, which actually leads me to one of the main, maybe main points to start off with first is like, how much of a problem is this that you're solving? Cross-border payments. I, I think our sustainable growth can be attributed to how much of an issue cross border payments is right. You know, you see, thousands of reports from all sorts of different countries and individuals and businesses focusing on how to quote unquote solve the cross-border payments problem 
right? And that's because cross-border payments are expensive, they're slow, they're not transparent, and they're incredibly inconvenient. And WISE has, you know, in my opinion, <laughs> made a huge impact in the marketplace in terms of solving those particular issues. And I suppose one particular issue you're focusing on right now is trying to eliminate junk fees. And, and that's going to be a, a big sort of thread for our conversation today. Could you give us a, a headline? What, what do we mean by junk fees? Where's this term come from? And why is this a big focus area for WISE? Sure. So when we launched our own junk fees initiative, so you know, conducting consumer research, learning more about how Americans felt about junk fees, it was in response to this being a key focus of the Biden administration. And there, you know, they officially refer to charges that are unnecessary, unavoidable, or inflate pricing while adding little to no value. So we wanted to learn more about this, mostly because there didn't seem to be a lot of consumer research out there as to what junk fees actually meant, you know, what do consumers think they are, how are they impacted by them, and also because it was so closely related to our mission, which is specifically transparency in cross-border payments and specifically addressing exchange rate markups in cross-border payments. And if we think about junk fees in other domains, so you know, maybe things like overdraft fees or hotel resort fees, like I've, I've read some arguments that junk fees can have certain benefits. Like if you have overdraft fees, maybe that deters you from like having risky banking practices. Like how would WISE respond to that argument? Are junk fees always bad? Yeah, and I think there we didn't necessarily have a stance on what junk fees are bad and, and why they exist. It was more what does the average American think, right? And there they cited, you know, having huge issues with overdraft fees, for example, with credit card late fees. But to be clear, this isn't necessarily areas that WISE itself is engaged in, more observing, you know, what do consumers think about this? And WISE recently, you recently put out or commissioned a report that highlighted the negative impacts that junk fees can have on Americans, both financially and emotionally. Could you bring to life some of the key findings and what surprised you the most as a consequence of that report? Absolutely. So as mentioned, most of us think junk fees, you know, overdraft fees, credit card late fees, um, hotel surcharges, that sort of thing. But what we found interesting about this research and encouraging for our own research and advocacy is that 81% of Americans also agree, for example, that a fee hidden in a financial transaction internationally, I mean, is a junk fee. So perhaps less surprising, but things that gave us pause, you know, over half of respondents noted junk fees are negatively impacting their financial situations. Over half also cited a negative influence on their well-being. It was pretty clear to us that these unexpected charges are really taking a toll on Americans' mental health. From the policy perspective also, it was interesting that some, or most, I guess, 74% of Americans said junk fees are actually an important issue when determining a candidate to support or vote for. So that was a pretty standout stat for me personally. Rina, can I ask you a question rhetorically speaking? Uh, I teach rhetoric, so this this phrase called junk fees is fascinating to me. Mm. Is that a technical term or is that the uh, these fees are bad? Right. Like, no, that's such a good point from a rhetorical standpoint, right? Because it's it's inherently negative, right? The the junk fee. Um and no, there's there's not a legal definition of the word, at least not the term that the administration's using, right? And I think you're right that that's with the goal of making the reaction to this being negative. Um, and that said, actually, that's why maybe when we initially saw this come out in 2022, when the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau first started putting this rhetoric out there, we said, oh my gosh, this is where hidden fees and exchange rate markups should live, right? You know, this is what should we be talking about, because this is a perfect example of something that's a junk fee. Right. And relatively, if I'm, I'm not a bond expert, but there are such things called junk bonds. And I believe that's like a technical category that both implies what it means, but is also like an actual tier of rating. It's not just meant de merely derogatory. So. Totally agree with you. Yeah, no, that is definitely a legal term. And, and that's not, I think, what the Biden administration was necessarily getting at, not to speak for them. But I think that's where we saw that confusion and thought, oh, this is a great place for research, right? We need to do some clarification here on what people actually think this means. It is great that at least one of the parties has got this as a focus area, specifically it is 
you know, helpful to so many Americans. Well, this isn't a politics podcast, but um, if the if the Biden administration doesn't survive through the next election, does does this issue get back, Bernard? Do you think? Does Wise have a view on that? Oh, such a good question. I mean, I, I think, unfortunately, like most things, the term junk fees did become very deeply politicized. And while I don't necessarily have a stance on that, nor does Wise, we'd hope that whatever administration would at least respond a bit to the research and and reflect on the fact that some of these fees, you know, namely junk fees in exchange rate markups, continue to be addressed, right? Because no matter what terminology you use, they aren't that great. <laughs> and, and is the US sort of lagging other parts of the developed world around these sort of things? What are we like in the UK, for example, do you know? So I think transparency is stronger in the UK. There have been you know, initial laws put out. And I think what we continue to find, you know, similar to the US with the 2012 remittance rule, is there continuing to be loopholes, which is why I think a, a full approach where it's not just approaching governments, but it's also working with other companies in the system is pretty critical. And that's actually where, if I can like briefly pitch Wise Platform, for example, you know, we connect our infrastructure with other payments providers in need of a good international infrastructure. And since ours is great, but also very transparent, that actually brings more partners along the way who increase transparency in the marketplace. So this kind of goes back to, you know, to answer other countries. Yes, I I would say that the UK is further ahead on the transparency front, but a piece of that needs to be outside of laws, right? It needs to also be market driven in order to truly get there. I think it's a really powerful part of the wise proposition to a shareholder. Like I saw in the news just a few days ago, uh, you've recently announced a partnership with Nubank in Brazil for their Indigo customers, so the highest tier of customers, to now essentially have, I guess, what, like a white labeled wise international banking facility for Brazilians when they travel overseas. That's fantastic. Thank you. Thank you. We are so proud of the unique infrastructure that WISE has built right? Unlike a traditional international payment where you need to hit a bunch of banks and central banks in order to get to your final destination. And each of those blips results in a fee, results in a delay. With WISE, because this is all done in a closed loop system internally, you avoid those blips. So sorry, I don't need to go on about this, but it, it definitely, you know, is helpful, I think, for partners to your to your point. Um, would, would it be worth sidebarring just for a minute into... Like, how do WISE achieve that? What's the what's the sort of secret source that have enabled you guys to achieve this sort of speed, transparency, and cost efficiency over the legacy correspondent banking system that everybody else uses? Absolutely. And that's, again, you know, where that world-class infrastructure comes into play, where, you know, if I'm sending money to my sister, for example, who's in Indonesia, that money actually doesn't cross borders, right? It goes from my U.S. bank account details within WISE to an Indonesian bank account details and then to hers. It's quite brilliant, really. And, and it's something I so credit the founders for coming up with because I think it's really changed the game in terms of cross-border payments. In that way, really addressing these three points of speed, cost and transparency that are universally cited as being issues in, in the cross-border payments market. So, so I suppose as we talk about Wise's business model, what have been the biggest obstacles, do you think, that the company's faced in this mission to try and... Uh, try and land these capabilities into all the countries you operate in? Oh, well, I'm going to come at this with my bias in that I'm, you know, in the policy space, but regulatory hurdles in some countries have been just enormous. And you see this in the United States in particular, where unlike every other G7 country, was at least taken steps towards allowing for payments access. So allowing payments companies to directly access payments rails. You know, when you say the sentence, it makes sense to do this. (laughs) Um, The United States still requires you to basically be a depository institution or virtually a bank, right? So this is where you see fintechs, you know, folding themselves over to become, you know, a lender, for example, just to access the payment system, something that's been a huge hurdle in the United States in particular, which is such an important market when it comes to remittances. And that's a bummer. Yeah, I guess. And if you're not a bank and you don't have those uh, that sort of direct access, you've almost got one arm tied behind your back when you try mm-hmm. and offer these capabilities, both to international customers trying to send money into the US, but also for US citizens using WISE or a WISE platform partner to send money out. It's just slower, I guess. Yeah, absolutely. Slower and way more expensive. And that's where, you know, a huge nod to the UK 
where in 2018, we were the first non-bank to directly access the system, right? And as a result, we were able to, because of the reduced partner fees, you know, the lack of blips that I mentioned earlier, um, payments went from 15 minutes to under 20 seconds or instant. And they, we were also able to cut customer costs by 20% right away. So just a testament to how important access to payment systems is for improved cross-border payments. And to what extent is is it a sort of uh, a national challenge or a state-by-state state challenge in the U.S.? Ooh, that's such a good question because, you know, the, I do think the states have been trying to come together to acknowledge the fact that there needs to be some sort of more consistent framework, right? And that's where a huge nod to the Conference of State Banking Supervisors to individual state banking leaders has been awesome and inspiring, and it's been awesome to try to work with them on this. That said, as, as you've probably seen, there's been a lot of federal calls for some sort of federal payments framework. And I think a piece of that is, you know, looking to Canada, for example, where they did move to regulate payments companies on the federal level, and as a result are now able to allow access because there's a federal regulator, right? And, and in that way, you see the need for some sort of federal oversight in order to allow that modernization and innovation to continue. I always like asking what seem to me really dumb, simple questions. And there's one I have on my mind. One of the things that I was so impressed by, just not only how WISE works internationally, just the ease and transparency and speed, but when I opened up my app, I saw that there was a 4.85 APY interest rate, which led me to wonder how am I getting paid more than say my Apple Goldman Sachs account. And, and so forgive me for the simplicity of this, but what, what uh, yeah. Yeah, no, I'm so actually glad you asked. This is a pretty new feature of ours, you know, it's launched in 2022 or even 2023, I believe. And basically we were earning a ton of interest off of the balances that we were holding with our partner bank, right? And we wanted to, in the nature of wanting to be transparent and affordable, pass those savings along to our customers. This is actually pretty novel, right? In the sense that while we very clearly are not a bank, right? We are not managing these funds for our customers. That's actually the role of the partner bank who's also creating that interest. We're just passing that along. And so that's been a really interesting, I think, journey on the state level, right? Explaining the differences and then slowly, because again, it's a state by state system getting approved by different states to be able to pass this interest along to our customers. Um, I'm so, I'm glad you brought that up actually, because it's a very, very interesting feature that is kind of outside of the realm of what you'd think of a normal money transmitter doing until you think about the details, right? Right, and to play devil's advocate, the, the, that phrase, just passing it along, seems too good to be true. I mean, how often are companies actually acting actively on behalf of the customer? But but there there it was, right? And so now I was left with the choice. I said this to Luke, like, why would I not put my money into my WISE account if the APY is higher than any other bank that I'm using? And also it allows me to transfer my money easily, both to settle my gambling debts to Luke and also my life in Sicily. He got lucky, by the way, the way he... Huh. he he got the, 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 that's a side story, but regardless. Um, so yeah, it feels almost like a too good to be true scenario. And yet before my eyes, it, it, lo and behold, the interest rate is actually accruing. So I get this question a lot, especially when advocating for more transparency in the marketplace, right? You know, why is WISE doing this? <laughs> and what benefit does it have to you? And I, that's where we have to go back to, I think our founding story, which is, you know, Christo, our founder and CEO, trying to send money across borders, losing a ton of money in that transaction, thinking there must be a better way. And along the journey, picking up quite a few very excited individuals, including myself, who have also seen a similar thing happen and want to just improve the market in general. And I wish it was more complicated than that, like a lot of just really mission driven folks saying, you know, hey, we're sitting on this money. Why? Um, but but. It actually is that simple. <laughs> it almost reminds me of like the early days of the Amazon story and Jeff Bezos and this mm -hmm. ruthless focus on customer centricity. How do we provide the best possible service and everything else is secondary? Mm -hmm. And 
this seems very authentically part of the wise mission. You know, you listen to almost every earnings call uh, way back, and this is very a very clear thread from the top. Thank you. Yes, and even the day to day interactions. You know, the different employees here. You get the sense that everyone's kind of working towards this shared goal for a reason, and that's kind of cool. You know, I'll, I'll pipe in here and just say this is so uh, maybe a straw man kind of thing, but yeah. Uh, in terms of, you know, competition from other financial institutions, Wells Fargo, for example, the main bank I use, some of the practices that were discovered there were outright m- malevolent, I would say, like, like not great, you know, like forcing customers into all kinds of things they had no idea about and so on and so forth. So I don't know. I don't mean to simplify like good versus evil. Like that's obviously right. too, too dualistic, but it, it does seem like there's an ethical core to wise that seems to be fundamentally often not there in other financial institutions. Thank you. And, and I suppose not just within the company, but uh, you know, it is, it's impressive the efforts you're making to influence policy. As you said earlier, bring the US to the table in modernizing its payments regulatory framework and its its banking system really, in some ways, bring it up to par with some other countries where we're perhaps a little more mature. For example, we were talking about direct access to payment systems. You know, I gather that is something that most other countries, including the UK, most of Europe, already offer. The US are kind of lagging there. Yeah, absolutely. I think that's a very clear point of being behind in terms of our payments system. Lack of direct access is pretty striking. Beyond policy, is WISE taking any other steps to uh, try and drive modernization of the, the regulatory framework in the US? Transparency and access to payment systems are definitely our two most important principles when you talk about like regulatory interactions. But I think you can probably open that up more broadly to other things that would make cross-border payments better. And that's an interesting thing in the US in particular. While you know, we are by definition a country of immigrants, right? And and there are many people with international lives here. It is striking how many Americans you interact with that have much more domestic experiences, right? So I think it's a little harder to deliver the cross-border message here in, in comparison with maybe other jurisdictions. And that's where conversations around small businesses, for example, are really interesting. You know, small businesses trying to go on that global scale you know, you kind of have to open it up past the more traditional cross-border payments user in a different country. So maybe we should turn our uh, our lens to the future and look ahead a little bit. So mm-hmm. what are WISE's main priorities in the area of consumer protection and cross-border payments? Sure. Um, I think on the note of transparency, we were very, very encouraged to see the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau or CFPB, whose remit, you know, includes remittances. Uh, They came out with a circular or basically a clarification of existing law very recently saying that you can't market zero dollar fees and then hide the fee in the exchange rate markup. That, believe it or not, was really cool and exciting and new. You know, even acknowledging that exchange rate markups are a problem was massive. So I think one of our main policy priorities is continuing to you know, push towards further clarification. You know, can we clarify that the remittance rule when it says to show fees, it means fees and exchange rate markups too. I think that would go a long ways to address transparency in the market and to bring costs down because then consumers could truly apples to apples comparison shop. So that's one principle we've talked about already, you know, access to payment systems. This would be within the remit of the U.S. Federal Reserve. So they, in theory, could allow for some sort of payment specific access to the Fed payment system, right? You know, currently while we're we're unique from other countries and that we just have one master account that has everything, you know, lending, access to the Fed's discount window, this sort of thing. Whereas other countries have moved towards a more focused access option for just payments companies. You know, so that's our strong suggestion to the Federal Reserve. And we're not alone in these suggestions, right? The G20 cross-border working group, which is made up of global leaders, including the World Bank, including the Fed itself, these recommendations are in that working group as well. You know, it's not just one company fighting for this. It's it's truly a global effort. How do you envision the future of the industry evolving in the coming years? I think at WISE, something we say a lot is 
sending money across borders should be as simple as sending an email. And that's <laughs> maybe the end goal, right? What if you could know that your payment will arrive instantly and it was free and maybe someday we'll get there. And that, that is still part of the mission, right? Eventu- to make international transfers eventually free, like yes. no, no charge, the mid rate, no cost whatsoever. Absolutely. Yes. So free. as a business, then where would the uh, majority of your own revenue come from? If you're, you know, giving it away sort of like Robin Hood, if all the gold is going yeah. into the pockets of the right. consumer, then, then where's, where do you get yours? I mean, we still charge fees for services, right? So for example, we don't necessarily cross subsidize something I think is pretty cool about WISE. We charge you for the amount that something costs, right? So for example, if I get a debit card, you'd probably find it notable that we charge a bit of money to receive that debit card. But that's because it's the amount of money that that costs for the employees to make the debit card to assign the account details, this sort of thing. I think that continued model would be successful here. So that example make, to- totally makes sense. But you're a company uh, worth billions of dollars growing. Uh, and so the markup for, you know, the cost of a debit card doesn't seem like substantial in terms of, you know, an investor saying, oh, where's all the future growth going to come from? Yeah. So our products, as, as you know, span outside of a traditional remittance, right? So we also offer, for example, multi-currency accounts. So right now I have on my phone the option to go into different types of currencies where I'd be able to, for example, when I'm visiting Indonesia or visiting a different country, be able to use the ATM with my ATM card and just operate completely in that currency, you know, really live, living, traveling, et cetera, like a local. So that's one avenue. Additionally, our partnerships via WISE platform are pretty notable here. You know, I'll, I'll flag that because our infrastructure at this point is so strong, we're incredibly popular within payments providers and have a lot of very strong partnerships because folks want to use the infrastructure that we've taken so long to build. And I think these reasons and, you know, our additional products are reasons that we're going to continue to be valuable in the space without having to charge our consumers more than they need to be paying for a payment. Yeah, clearly. And uh, I'll jump in on this one as well, because I'm a big fan of the, the company as a shareholder. You know, I've clearly, I don't own this company because it's a charity and gives away Uh, you know, these fantastic capabilities to its customers. WISE makes its fair earnings as well as providing benefits to customers. So for example, Christoph, when you have your money in your account and you're earning four point something percent, WISE is also earning some money on the money you have deposited with them. And actually it's a challenge for the company right now. There's uh, there's results coming out, I think next week, I'm looking forward to seeing uh, how your CFO is wrangling with the problem of having too much interest income, how are you, how are you going to find ways to give that back to customers in different ways? How about a 6% APY or seven? Let's, let's keep it going, right? Right, right. I'm with you. So Rena, how does WISE plan to shape the future of financial services in the US? And you, you're advocating for policies that promote innovation, competition, consumer protection. Um, where do you see the company taking this mission? I think, you know, continuing to improve the lives of people who live international lifestyles as much as possible, right? And that's everything from improving payments, right, through advocacy for transparency, through advocacy for direct access, you know, taking a special look at folks maybe unique to the U.S. system. So, for example, small businesses looking to compete on that global scale, right? What sort of needs that they have that are unique to maybe your traditional individual cross-border payments user. A lot of that, for example, is the ability to link things like your accounting software. It sounds simple, but as someone that did mess up our own QuickBooks at a small business when we went international, I can definitely attest to how necessary that is, you know, looking at their unique needs. And then finally, again, not to harp on the platform side, but in addition, supporting, you know, smaller banks, credit unions, payments providers who do want to continue to provide their customers with high level service on the international side and using WISE to do it. So that may be on the market side. Those are the ways that we're improving the cross-border payments market. And then also just through our mission, right? And you can see that maybe even going to our page on WISE.com and noticing that we have a transparency tool. So you can actually look and see where your payment would be cheapest, even if it's not WISE. Through actions like these, 
we're not just driving down the cost of our own product, but we're driving down the cost of cross-border payments more generally, right? Improving that competition through transparency and showing who's actually being transparent, improving access to payment systems, not just for wise, right? But for other small players in the market who are also, you know, doing good. I think this will lead to improve cross-border payments across the board, which is a goal of most people, you know, I work with here. That's a nice transition, I think, to this notion of empowering customers. Hmm. At Seven Investing, we offer fundamental research so that individual investors feel a little more confident in, in placing their bets because they know and understand the company. What can individual consumers do to protect themselves from junk fees and advocate for greater transparency in the financial services industry? I think first being aware that there likely will be an exchange rate markup depending on the provider that you're using, being very cautious of advertisements, for example, that will show zero dollar or no fees, you know, being conscious that that will likely result in a fee. Also, um, and this is so the policy person speaking, but the CFPB has a great consumer portal, right? If something happens to you in your day-to-day financial transactions that you see as unfair, you can report it directly to the Bureau. And in a lot of cases, they're pretty responsive. So that's one way that you can protect yourself. But in terms of proactively looking ahead for ways that you can avoid junk fees, I do believe that continuing to read up, you know, listening to podcasts like this, it totally benefits the consumer, right? And helps everybody out. And are there any other resources or tools that WISE offer consumers to help them navigate these complexities? Yeah, that we do have a blog actually where you can go and search your specific question. So for example, oh, I'm traveling to Italy and I want to know more about how to navigate the payment system there. WISE has travel blogs like this that are really helpful. I can actually attest from personal. I didn't realize we had this until I went on a surf trip to Portugal and it was really useful. (laughs) Um, So that's one way. In addition, we do have additional tools as well for small businesses in particular. Um, So maybe in that way, you aren't necessarily finding everything that you need on small business platforms on the government side. So for example, ITA and SBA and different acronyms that mean the support systems for small businesses, you can actually find more payment specific information on the WISE website on our blog posts. Very good, Verena. So if you started today's episode and uh, you're planning a vacation and you're using your legacy bank or you're planning to use your legacy credit card, Maybe have a little think about these hidden fees, these junk fees. Maybe your existing provider, although they're offering you free transfers, maybe there's costs built into that. Maybe a chance to go and uh, ask yourself a few questions if you're listening to today's podcast about how you do international banking and how you travel internationally. Rena, thanks so much for sharing your time with Seven Investing podcast listeners. We really appreciate your insights. I appreciate you. This was fantastic. You've been listening to the Seven Investing Podcast, where it's our goal to empower you to invest in your future. If you want to know more, swing by seveninvesting.com slash subscribe and get a fantastic deal on your first month of membership and access to our deep repository of nearly 200 stock recommendations, deep dive videos, and regular company updates. Little secret, one of those 200 is a company we've been talking about today. Mm-hmm.